Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back to another COPEC Financial Wellness Program. Today, uh, we're going to be doing a uh, one-hour lecture from, uh, from Jill Spradlin, a uh, CPA here locally, and our topic today is going to be uh, the CARES Act and some tax changes that have been going on. Um, I wanted to go ahead and welcome everybody. My name is Jay Linder. I'm a, uh, the president of COPEC, and I'm happy to be here with everybody and to get everything started here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a brief introduction to COPEC, make sure everybody's all on the same page, and um, make sure everybody's on the same page, and um, introduce a little bit of the concepts that we're bringing to the table, the different portal uh, programs through COPEC. So the first thing I need to do is, is first of all, I apologize about the disclosure, but we got to go through a, a nice disclosure page here. I'm going to leave this up here for about 45 seconds to a minute. Uh, make sure you have a chance to read through due to uh, affiliated companies and things of that nature with uh, retirement strategies and RS Tax Account and many of the other groups that are part of uh, COPEC. So take a moment, check that out, and uh, we'll be back with you in just a few seconds here. And uh, hopefully you've had a chance to go through that. If, you're not, if, you, if you didn't get to go through the whole thing, go ahead and screenshot it, or you can go to the copeceducation.org uh, website. We have that under disclosure as well, and so you can see that there. So we appreciate uh, being able to go through that. Now, I um, wanted to go through a couple things. Obviously, what is COPEC? It is a nonprofit organization that brings education out to the community without any marketing, sales, or cost to you. Um, our experts are experts in their field, and uh, they are willing and uh, able to share their expertise with you. And uh, everybody is very much um, a proponent of education, so we appreciate the chance to do this. Um, COPEC, uh, the Financial Wellness Fridays programs, these are um, an opportunity for us to bring the lecture series to you on a user basis versus um, through a organized uh, structure in a company or church or something like that. And um, there's a laundry list of programs that we actually have that, we, that we're gonna be doing throughout the year. So every Friday, we're gonna be doing this lecture series along with some, some other resources. The Financial Wellness Fridays is a key part, but then we also do the daily web show every day from 2 o'clock to 2.30, and then from 2.30 to 3, we have extra discussions, Q&A, things like that in case you have questions. Um, obviously, technology, things may happen, so we may have a break in technology. If that happens, we'll get it up and running as fast as possible. And then, please, if you're part of an organization and you want to share this with others, if you have other coworkers, friends, families, uh, feel free to share the website and the links uh, uh, within the website with anybody that uh, you think might be interested in listening in. We'd love to have them and it's open to anybody. As you can see on the right side, same as our daily programs, our Financial Wellness Fridays, the, this is a list of a lot of our volunteer speakers that donate their time and we really appreciate them doing that so you can see who the uh, different speakers are. On the website, The Daily Show, if you are on this portal, if you go into the copeceducation.org website, um, it should be pretty easy to find the portal. And then inside there, you can see there's six different tiles. The top left is our Daily Show. Uh, the blue link is how you get in. And then the orange links are the calendars of upcoming programs. So if you, if you happen to find a certain, here's a calendar of uh, August, for example, if you find, uh, We'd love to have you every day, but if you find a certain uh, daily topic that you want, put it on your calendar and tune in. Uh, but we'd love to have you join us every day if possible. In the middle, uh, two, three times a year, we actually do um, a free uh, retirement readiness. It's called Retirement Decisions. 
Uh, this really helps people as far as prepare for and transition into retirement. It's a really big, uh, important life event. And uh, we really want to make sure that people have an, as much information as possible. We do spend quite a bit of time also on state pension tiers, STRS, OP, uh, OPERS, um, and making sure that the state pension, Social Security, and private pensions all work well together, depending on where, uh, which ones you utilize. Um, also today, this is a Financial Wellness Fridays. If you go to this tab, not only to log in and the orange button at the top, but all of the blue buttons down below is the ongoing every Friday schedule that we'll have. And we're gonna try to keep that, I think right now we have it scheduled out for two months, and we're gonna try to get that out three months or longer. So hopefully, you, if you're an organization, you can plan around it. If you're uh, just wanting to tune in, hopefully that'll give you some ideas to what's coming around the corner. If you are an organization and you want to have a special webinar set up, let's say you really like Jill today and you'd love for her to speak to your organization uh, specifically for um, a private uh, webinar, then fill this out. Let us know what you're looking to do and we will help you facilitate that and set that up with any of the speakers or programs that we have. Uh, so we're happy to do that at your convenience. And uh, lastly, if you as an individual have a particular question or concern um, that we're not able to cover today, today's program, the Financial Wellness Friday Lectures, is really not an integrated back and forth Q&A. That is available from 2.30 to 3 through the Daily Show. But if you do have questions, a personal concern, you want to reach out one way or the other, feel free to reach out to Jill directly or myself, or just schedule a time through the calendar and we'll get you taken care of. So hopefully that's a good review. We're going to go ahead and get uh, get Jill. Uh, Jill, you there? Yes. We're going to go ahead and get Jill set up here. Jill, happy to have you here with us. We're going to, you know, uh, you've been doing this for quite some time. You've been a CPA for what, about 30 years? Is that about yes. right? So you, you pretty much have seen this stuff come and go, a lot of different tax changes and IRS laws. and, and Yes, uh, great changes. A lot of changes, absolutely. And so i um, real excited about you being able to converse a little bit about what's been going on recently with the uh, COVID and some of these. I know that the SECURE Act was done before COVID happened and the CARES Act happened after. And there's some commonality there, if I recall. But um, tell us a little bit about what you think uh, we're going to be learning today. Well, we were going to focus on some of the existing provisions of the CARES Act. That was the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act that was passed, I believe, in March. Um, and some of the um, provisions of that, some of the ongoing tax consequences of those, and maybe even discuss a little bit about thoughts for the future. Um, nothing is decided yet as to what's going to come down the pike, but definitely additional legislation is coming. Well, I know they're, yeah, they're talking about that right now, right? I mean, obviously, right. there's a lot of conversation right now as far as whether there's a fourth uh, bill or something that, that's coming out. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's additional stimulus, um, extension of the unemployment, additional uh, assistance for businesses. So that's what we're going to be discussing today in a little more detail. Um, and then uh, if, if anyone has any questions or, or uh, more detailed concerns after that, they can feel free to contact us. Well, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, enjoy the program. And uh, Jill, you can go ahead and uh, pull up your presentation and we'll, we'll get going. So thanks for coming. Okay, thank you. hope everyone can see our slides. We've got some um, beginning slides for the uh, coronavirus tax changes discussion and um, just a little bit about the background. As everyone knows, the um, coronavirus illness first hit or was became very apparent in late February, early March and Subsequently, um, many businesses closed, shut down. Uh, with that, um, a number of people became unemployed. A, no a number of people um, 
were unsure what to do about ongoing health issues. Have I not shared it? There we go. And so since March, 1,006 th bills have been introduced into Congress. Most of those are um, in some stage of discussion and have not passed. I believe only nine have passed. Uh, an additional 1,137 regulations have been passed by 55 various federal and state agencies and over 2,600 contracts for testing services, medical and equipment, various things have been awarded to companies. So although it often seems like things are at a complete standstill, there has been a lot of activity and things, you know, things have happened. Some of those are um, to do with businesses, some with individuals, and some with, um, with in, in infected employers and employee situations. Obviously, certain industries have been seriously hit, restaurant industry, uh, a lot of retail outlets closed completely for a while. Um, even, even service businesses, to some extent, they were better able to work from home and things like that, but still were impacted as their customers were impacted as well. So um, it's pretty much been widespread that all sectors of the economy have felt these changes. Um, some of the assistance given to individuals and businesses has been ongoing since that time and is now expiring. So we have, um, right now, as, as we speak, I believe Congress is, is um, working on legislation to extend or replace some of those benefits. Um, it, initially, the recovery rebates, I think as everyone knows, Taxpayers received about $1,200 per adult, $2,400 for joint filing couples, plus $500 for each qualifying child. That was considered a recovery rebate, which is being treated, it's, it's to be based on your 2020 income. Uh, it, in order to get the payments out, they were based on an estimate based on your 2018 or 2019 income. And there was a phase out of income over $150,000 for married filing joint returns, $75,000 for single returns, and $112,500 for head of household returns. Incomes above that saw a phase out in the, in the um, recovery rebate they received. Um, these will not be taxable. They're not considered taxable income. However, they were estimates based on the information from the 2018 or 2019 tax return of the filer. So if something changes, for instance, if a young person was claimed as a dependent on a parent's 2018 or 2019 return, and then in 2020 files and claims their own um, dependency exemption or is not a dependent of their parent, they will belatedly receive the $1,200 um, recovery rebate then at that time. Uh, some other things uh, that could change would be if, um, if a couple received, perhaps had a child in 2020 and did not have that child um, acclaimed as a dependent on their earlier tax return they would then receive the additional $500 of, of rebate when they filed their 2020 return. Um, these are not to be taxable income. There is talk of, of doing an additional recovery rebate check. Um, so stay tuned for that. It's completely up in the air as to timing, amount, or how that one would be handled. Um, I think there's a widespread perception that there is a need for an additional um, sum to go out to at least certain taxpayers. Uh, other individual um, provisions were that taxpayers can take up to $100,000 in a distribution from a retirement plan, such as a 401k or IRA, without being subject to the 10% early withdrawal if they 
um, either had been diagnosed with coronavirus or, or one of their family members, a spouse or dependent, had been uh, diagnosed with the disease, or if they had experienced uh, adverse financial consequences from being laid off, perhaps quarantined, furloughed, or had their hours reduced because of the um, virus. So in that case, if you take a such a distribution, there is tax on the um, distribution, as there always is, but there would be no 10% early withdrawal. In addition, it can be repaid within three years. So the tax hit would not be realized all at once. Um, some, other, some other changes were charitable deductions. Next year, when the 2020 tax returns are filed, a charitable deduction above the line, in other words, you won't have to itemize deductions, to take a charitable deduction of up to $300 um, on, on the 2020 return. In addition, the AGI limitations, adjusted gross income limitations on charitable con contributions for 20, will go to 100% of income for individuals, 25% of income for corporations. Um, that's an increase in the amount of charitable deductions you would be able to take as an itemized deduction. H high deductible health plans will also uh, now allow for telehealth and other remote care services, which became popular as healthcare had to um, react to the changes in the um, climate and um, they will now be eligible for payments out of the high deductible health plans without charging a deductible. Um, all, in addition, more over-the-counter uh, medical expenses can be re reimbursed from a health savings account, an Archer medical account, or other reimbursement arrangement. So those regulations have been relaxed a bit to recognize the increase in um, such things as telehealth and, and remote care. Some of the advantages for employers are payroll tax credit refunds, where credit for a required paid sick leave and credit for required paid family leave can be refunded in advance um, using forms and instructions that are still being developed for that purpose. Um, the payroll um, relief is to in sure the employers have adequate cash flow to get them through this period. Most employers are having reduced revenue and at the same time they are facing increased costs for cleaning, disinfecting, and observing other um, COVID health provisions. So anything that puts more money into the pockets of the employers right now and allows them to keep their workforce on is the, um, that is the idea behind payroll tax credit refunds and payroll tax payment delays. Um, the existing bill delays the payment of payroll taxes 50% until the end of 2021 and 50% until the end of 2022. So it is not a non-payment of the employer share of payroll taxes, but it does allow an extended payment period again, in order to increase the cash flow available to a business right now during the crisis. There's an employee attention, retention credit in the existing bill, which it creates an employee retention credit um, for employers that have had to close due to the pandemic. Um, but if they are able to keep their workforce on, the eligible employers are allowed a credit against employment taxes. Um, this, again, is, an, is a way, a method to keep additional funds in the hands of the employers where they can hopefully not lay off workers and not have to close their doors permanently as um, the extended period of time has made it very difficult for some employers to even stay open. And the thinking is that we want to have businesses available for the workers to come back to when the crisis is over. Um, they are allowed a, a credit of up to 50% of qualified wages, up to $10,000 for each employee. 
Um, the wages do not include the wages counted for the purposes of the paid sick leave and paid family tax leave credits. So there's no um, double dipping of employer credits, but it is an additional program that's available. Um, businesses are, are um, able to take a net operating loss carry back um, with, the new, the, with the existing bill so that they um, may carry back and amend a prior year return to receive some refund from a loss retained this year. Um, the bill also repeals the excess loss limitation that was currently in place. So these are tax changes that are favorable to businesses to allow them to more quickly realize the tax savings brought about by losses they're incurring right now. Um, in addition, there, are, there was a loan program, a very popular one, you've probably heard of it, called the Payroll Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we've helped a number of clients um, obtain these. They are loans designed to allow employers to continue keeping their workforce and paying their workforce during a period of downtime when they may not be operating or be operating on a reduced basis. Um, some of the criteria changed a bit initially for these loans. 75% of the funds had to be used for payroll, 25% for other business expenses in order for the program, for the loan to become forgivable and treated as a grant rather than a loan. Um, in addition, the, the initial time frame to spend the funds was only eight weeks. That quickly, it became apparent that that was not adequate. So the bill has been revised to allow only 60% of the funds to be used directly for payroll and 40 up to 40% to be used for other business expenses and still retain the forgivability of the loan. Um, also, the time frame to expend the funds was increased from eight weeks to 24 weeks. So most businesses, um, the, the time frame begins when the loan proceeds were received and most businesses have not yet filed for forgiveness of the loan amounts because that time frame has not expired yet. Um, it is possible to go ahead and file for the forgiveness if the funds have already been expended in a manner that allows, that meets the criteria. Um, the loans that become, um, that, that are forgiven and become in essence a grant, there is ongoing discussion about the treatment of the expenses paid from those loan proceeds. Uh, the original, the original rules stated that the expenses paid with the loan proceed funds would not then be deductible on the business's tax return. Um, I know the AICPA and some other organizations are attempting to take that up and, and, and get that changed so that the uh, expenses will remain deductible on tax returns. That's still an open issue at this time. Um, loan forgiveness works by uh, filling out an additional form, uh, which actually goes to the lender that the loan was received from. Um, and if the criteria are met regarding the purpose of the funds, the use of the funds, and within the prescribed time, the loan then does not need to be repaid. If it is, if it does not meet those forgiveness um, provisions, the, the percentage, the interest percent is very, very low. It's, it's still a very favorable program. Um, but the thinking is that most small businesses probably can achieve the loan forgiveness. Uh, there has been, the, the program was actually extended from June 30th to August 8th, which is tomorrow, um, as Congress voted a second round of funding for the, the loans. That is still not completely used as, as the latest um, reporting that I understand. And so whether it would be further extended or whether more funds may be allocated to such a program is also something that's currently under discussion. It's very possible that a more targeted program uh, aimed at certain industries 
with a little more proof that the business has been actually harmed and, and their business has been decreased by 25 to 50% may be required for a second round of loans. In addition to the, those loans, there were, um, there were uh, economic injury disaster loans, which were uh, available to small businesses to provide capital. And the interest rate on those was 3.75% for most bar borrowers and 2.75% for not-for-profit or charitable organizations. Uh, those loans, the maximum amount was only $150,000, whereas the PPP loans were much higher. The term is quite lengthy and um, the borrowers did have to pr pr prove economic injury from the COVID virus pandemic. Uh, those loans were not nearly, I think, as popular as the PPP loans, and there was no double dipping. You had to apply for one or the other type of loan. Um, in addition to those provisions, we had, um, we had some um, individual items that individual taxpayers may take advantage of. And those things um, are, are being uh, discussed for extension or additional help. Uh, as I think most everyone knows, the federal government has been adding $600 per week to unemployment benefits paid by states to unemployed workers. Um, that just ran out and Congress is hashing out whether to continue that amount or to continue some other amount, um, $500, $400, $200 have all been discussed as um, an additional payment in addition to whatever the state unemployment uh, calculation is. These things are all right now under, um, under discussion. So there's not, uh, there's not uh, much of a meeting in the minds, honestly, at the moment, and it may take a while to sort out what they're going to do. I think it's a fair guess to say that they're going to do something because they're very well, very aware that a number of people are still unemployed and have not been called back to work yet. In other cases, if some of businesses have closed, there will be no um, job to go back to and those employees will have to find uh, a new position. The uh, recovery rebates, in addition, may be extended or, or another round of those done. That seems to be uh, popular on both sides of the um, congressional aisle uh, because it, it's an immediate uh, boost to the economy and injects more money into the economy. One of the other things that has happened um, because of the slowdown in the economy is all the states are seeing reduced tax revenues, states and localities, at the same time as their costs have risen, in some cases dramatically. So uh, one of the things that they're discussing in additional help is to fund additional help to states, to hospitals, to schools, to cities, that are struggling with all these costs and greatly reduced revenue. So these are all pieces of a huge tax bill that um, is being discussed anywhere from one to three trillion dollars, depending on you know what what they're discussing at the moment. These are huge, huge numbers, obviously, but the alternative is even worse in that if they don't inject enough adequate money into the economy, then things will just come to a grinding halt and they and they will delay recovery many, many years. So the idea is to keep people in their homes, to try to keep them with enough income to continue to pay their rent and mortgages and, and utilities and so on. Um, some of the other things that have been kicked around have been uh, forgiveness of student loans, partial forgiveness of student loans, anything to help people who are really feeling a financial squeeze 
uh, because of the coronavirus and the fact that it has gone on longer than they maybe anticipated when they did the first round of funding and um, assistance programs. So those are some of the things that are um, happening right now in terms of filing next year's tax return. As I said, that will trigger the new um, or, or the revised economic rebate amounts that some people ha may have changes in their situation and that will increase um, or possibly trigger a economic recovery payment that they did not receive previously. For the most part, if something has changed where a, a family received perhaps a rebate um, that they, their 2020 return would not have them be eligible for, there will be no repayment of that rebate requested. So it's mostly just a positive thing that you would possibly receive uh, additional monies. But if something had changed and you received a rebate based on the 2018 or 2019 figures that was actually higher than it would have calculated off of the 2020 return, um, generally speaking, that's not going to be um, asked to be repaid. Uh, there were cases uh, where re uh, rebates were sent out to folks who had passed away and the government had requested people to send those back. Uh, again, I don't know if that didn't happen, what the consequences will be, but they don't seem to be um, too concerned about getting repayment of payments that went out in error. They did ask people to return them um, if, if they were received for a deceased person. Um, in addition to all those other items, the um, payroll taxes they are another thing that have been discussed uh, as delaying or reducing payroll taxes for Social Security and Medicare during the rest of the year to free up additional money for businesses to continue to support their uh, employees and pay their other bills. Um, that one is, does not have as much support as the continuation of the unemployment and as, as it would help mostly people who still have jobs, it would not be helpful to the folks who have, are still laid off. So that particular, um, provision is, is less likely, I think, to probably pass. But all in all, um, work continues on all these, these bills that are in place. I think they're at a bit of a standstill right at the moment, but um, my understanding is they do continue to meet, the, the committees are continuing to meet, and we'll, everyone kind of agrees that they're going to have to come up with additional help for folks. Um, the job numbers came out today and did, um, I believe they said 1.8 million jobs were added back in. So that's largely people returning to work who had been temporarily furloughed. Um, as far as longer term damage, um, that was described as the low hanging fruit, if you will, and longer term recovery of some businesses that may have closed or seen permanent impact to their operations. Um, may take a, a bit longer to come back, but so far the, the bounce back has been positive compared to where things were in April, May, um, and, and you know, a couple of months ago, things were much grimmer, I guess, than they are now. Uh, the, the virus continues to be ongoing, however, so there continues to be impact, especially to restaurants, retail industries, um, the, um, leisure section, entertainment industries, things such as that. Still no movies, no concerts, no um, uh, things like that that rely completely on large crowds attending. So the long-term impacts to industry such as that will, you know, will become apparent over time and any um, breaks to specific industries will have to be worked out um, to try to shore up certain um, specific areas of the economy. Um, obviously right now, some things are actually benefiting. Uh, the Amazons of the world are doing, doing very well. Um, 
And so there is economic activity on the other side that offsets to a degree some of the devastation from the slowdown. But it, this is a long-term problem and you can expect to see um, legislation probably over the next several years dealing with the fallout from these, these events. Um, Tax-wise, it remains to be seen uh, what they will discuss, anything to put into place. Um, there are things they can do, such as increasing um, the write-offs for businesses for, they've discussed, I think, write-offs for restoring write-offs for business lunches, meals, and entertainment. Uh, they can always increase the amount of capital expenditures that can be immediately written off um, to try to give spending a boost and to uh, preserve cash flow for affected businesses. Um, these are all tried and true tools that have been in use since the Depression. So um, they are going to have to continue to assess how much stimulus is needed to keep things going. And you can expect to see ongoing changes probably to tax law and to the forms as well. Uh, they had the unprecedented step of delaying the tax due date from April 15th to July 15th this year. Um, they had even discussed reducing or rather um, delaying things further to October or December and decided not to do that wisely, I think, because it really just pushes uh, the end of the 2019 filing season right up to the beginning of the 2020 filing season. And people, um, I don't know how helpful that is to uh, delay all payments due and then have them all come due together in say January of 2021 all at once. But they did give uh, relief that no federal, state or local payments were due um, either for a balance for 2019 returns or for the first two quarterly estimated payments for 2020, all of those were delayed until July 15th without penalty or interest. Um, whether something similar would ever be enacted uh, for a future year remains to be seen and probably depends on how much recovery is seen um, in, the, in the next second half of this year. Um, with all that being said, I, I had hoped that they would have passed some legislation this week that I could share with you and um, something definitive and that just hasn't happened yet. So unfortunately, we're not able to give you any more concrete information than that right now. Um,